Hello everyone, welcome to this live which I cheekily titled The Boomerang Avoidant Attacha and what I mean by this is the experience of dating someone with severe fearful avoidant attachment. What it's like for you, what it's like for them, what you can try and do to overcome this situation if it's becoming so problematic for you, whether you are the fearful avoidant or the person dating that individual with fearful avoidant attachment style. And I'm gonna talk about why it is one of the most addictive, problematic, difficult situationships, relationships to break up from, and is a nightmare for people who are involved in this dynamic. It is so damn painful. So before I get underway, I just wanna say, as always, hello everyone, welcome to this live. I am very much looking forward to talking about this experience with everyone who's here today. Feel free to leave your questions for me in the question mark box below, and I will get round to it. I wanna start out this live by saying, People who have dated individuals with a severe fearful avoidant attachment style will know exactly what I am talking about and why it is uniquely painful in many, many ways. This is something that's very different from dating someone with just a dismissive avoidant attachment style who just one and duns you. Yes, dating someone who has a dismissive avoidant attachment style where it's very severe and they're not working on themselves can be its own form of, you know, it can be problematic in its own way, like that's its own thing. It is another thing entirely to have a partner who is coming back and forward, breaking up with you one minute, coming back to be with you a month later, over and over again. It is a nightmare for individuals where they're constantly told, I love you, you're the person of my dreams, I have never felt so much love from anyone in my life before, you make the world to me, I am so sorry for how I've behaved, I would never do this to anyone, I love you so much. Only for, say, six weeks, a month, two months to go by, before that person's like, yeah, I just don't think I have any feelings for you anymore, I don't really like you anymore, feelings can change, why can't you understand that? And maybe even saying really rude things like, you know, I just don't think you're my body type preference. I think I just prefer other people. Why can't you just let it go? You're clearly more into me than I'm into you. And then proceed to abruptly break up over a phone conversation, ghosting you before reappearing in your life a couple of months later and then professing all the very things that I said before this and the cycle begins again. I'm gonna talk about a specific example of this in a minute, which will help people to understand for those of you that have never been through this, and for those of you who have, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. People who have a fearful avoidant attachment style are unique. This is also the disorganized attachment style. And if they lean more avoidant, this is what it means. They have a fear of intimacy and commitment, which is consistent for people with avoidant attachment, but they also have a very, very big fear of abandonment. Unlike the dismissive avoidance, who usually act very cavalier, like nothing can hurt them, and they seem to have what we call a superficial self-esteem, fearful avoidant attachers, on the other hand, have a very clear, bad self-esteem much of the time. These individuals are usually very self-deprecating. They don't usually have a very good respect for themselves. They often have financial issues, job issues, sometimes relational issues, and they have often come from a lot of trauma in their background. I really feel sorry for a lot of fearful avoidant attachers. And I wanna also make a quick disclaimer here too. I'm gonna to do my best to be fair to people who are on the receiving end of this experience and to the fearful avoidant attachers who wanna recover from this. I'm making space in this live to talk about, you know, both parties here down the line. But these individuals have come from some really gnarly stuff. Often, a lot of the times, there's not just the overbearing caregiver situation, there's a lot of inconsistency from their caregivers. There's often usually parents who are alcoholics, narcissists, drug addicts. There's a lot of intense stuff that's going on behind the scenes where there are promises made and promises that aren't kept. These individuals, you know, who are developing fearful avoidant attachment often have parents who may tragically die out of nowhere. There's a lot of loss and there's not a lot of teaching about how to regulate emotions. They've often come up with this narrative that people will constantly leave. I cannot trust anyone but myself to take care of my own emotional well-being. but I am also incredibly lonely and need to be with people because I suffer tremendous separation anxiety and I really struggle to be by myself. 
People with a fearful avoidant attachment style can range in their origins, where it may not necessarily be that extreme, but generally speaking, inconsistency is the theme of their background, and they've often usually developed such big themes of feeling betrayed by people who are closest to them, feeling like they can't disclose what they're thinking and feeling to others, feeling like they can never actually be vulnerable with people, yet simultaneously also being incredibly, usually in dating, needy for attention, company, validation, and also feeling like they can actually be with someone. So it is a very confusing experience where often at times you may feel like you're dating an anxious attacher, only to realize as dating progresses, you're actually dating someone with a fearful avoidant attachment style. So that's why you've got those competing fears of abandonment with your fears of intimacy and commitment. But usually one will, you know, usually what happens in dating, let's paint the example now, is this. You meet someone who's really funny, witty, charming, beautiful, effervescent, and you find that you have all these things in common. This individual's learning about psychology. They seem to be really put together, have had a lot of relational experiences, seem to know their way around the block, and they come across as being really impressive and just someone who you just fall head over heels for. This individual wants to hang out with you a lot. So you spend tremendous amount of time getting to know one another where you have all these great moments of connecting and bonding and having these really intense high chemistry moments together where you're spending a lot of time sharing a lot of memories and it really feels like you've met your soulmate. And then about 30 days in to two months, things start to feel rapidly weird in that you can feel that your partner has shifted quite rapidly where once they were enthusiastic and beyond the moon to see you, they're now saying, oh yeah, I'm busy. I just don't have time to see you anymore before maybe giving you a bit of a weird explanation as to why they can't see you at all, including maybe a text message being like, yeah, I just don't, I just can't do this anymore. And I wish you all the best. You're going to find someone so much better than me and abruptly ending the situationship that you had started. Only for then, for you, as you're mourning this experience and having tremendous insecurities where you feel like you've done something wrong, you are not good enough for this person, you weren't attractive enough for this person, that somehow, you know, you caused this entire thing, for them to come back in two months apologizing profusely for what happened in the first place and also declaring how sorry they are and how much they want to be with you and how they've never felt such love with someone else unlike you before. And then... Again, after about a month or two months later, they may actually become incredibly mean. They may see things like, yeah, I just never really loved you in the first place. You know, your body type isn't my preference. I just don't want to be with someone like this. I just need to be alone for a while. And they'll break up with you again. If their avoidant attachment is so bad, they may end up actually getting hooking up with new people before bouncing back to you, having these very empty, bottomless sexual encounters to try and make themselves feel better about themselves. Because as I've said consistently across a lot of my lives, avoidant attachers have a very bad relationship with guilt. They hate the idea of not being able to live up to their, the perception of their partner's wants and needs. And so often they're berating themselves and also feeling like they've done something terribly wrong. A notorious fearful avoidant habit is usually if they feel like, you know, they are solely responsible for what's happened and they know that they've done something wrong to hurt you, they will block you and you will be made to feel like the villain. They will block you on everything, but they'll do it almost intermittently. They'll start with something random like LinkedIn. Then it'll be Instagram a few months later. Then it'll be Facebook after a year. And you'll be really weirded out by this being like, why didn't you just block me on everything? Because often a lot of these people don't want to own up to the fact that they've done something wrong. And they often feel tremendous guilt and shame over their behavior and having to back away from you. But today we're going to talk about the fearful avoidance who don't block you straight away. And those that do, what happens when they keep coming back? I want to make it very clear that on a lot of my videos, I talk about a lot of the experience of what it's like when you've been broken up with by someone who has avoidant attachment and they don't come back. A lot of the time, people, including myself, when I went through this, pined and hoped that our avoidant partner would come back to us. But it's those that are dating the severely fearful avoidant attachers that know the horror and the nightmare that is when your avoidant partner does return and the cycle happens over 
and over and over again. I have to say, as someone who has had just an abrupt breakup with, a, you know, someone who I believe has avoidant attachment, I am so fucking grateful that it was one and done with the power of hindsight because I can assure you that when I look back on when I've listened to all of my clients who've been in fearful avoidant dynamics where there is someone who has a very severe fearful avoidant attachment style and the entire situation revolves around that person who, you know, because of their own insecurities are dictating the situation or relationship, the nightmare of being in a situation like this. Yes, the breakups are brutal, but imagine if you're going through that again and again and again. And then every time it happens, you have like a breakup, you feel tremendously insecure, your partner comes back to you and alleviates all those concerns and then leaves you again, doubling that insecurity rush all over again. And all of a sudden you're like, oh God, now I'm spiraling. And then this is what happens. You become addicted to that person for them to come back and to reassure you that it wasn't, you know, it wasn't you, it was them. You get to a stage where you become powerless and vulnerable to this situation where you don't even know what's up and down anymore. The intermittent reinforcement has become so bad that you are now in a situation where you are essentially a junkie waiting for that person to come back and give you even just a breadcrumb of a text to fuel your own level of self-esteem again. I have to say, yes, the breakup recovery from anyone with severe avoidant attachment is brutal, but I have to say, the people who are in the thick of the shit with a severe fearful avoidant attacher is arguably worse because until that ends and officially ends, there is no recovery. There is no recovery at all that's possible once you are, like when you are in the thick of the shit with someone where they're not working on their stuff, you're not able to work on your stuff because you're so overwhelmed by what's going on that unfortunately it either takes one of two things to happen. The fearful avoidant attacher needs to recognize, holy shit, I am contributing to this pattern and I need to go to therapy to work on this stuff because I cannot continue to do this to someone or the person that they're dating needs to recognize, I have to step away for my own health and well-being. Otherwise, this is not going to work out. Usually in these cases, I got to say, there is no good outcome that comes off the back of this unless both parties acknowledge they have things that they need to work on and to fix. It is really, really dysfunctional, painful for both people. And whilst it's really painful for the person who's going through the thick of this and suffering from the effects of codependency, withdrawal, and also dreading the idea that their partner will finally leave them while simultaneously battling with the idea that if they continue with more of this, it'll it's just too much to take. The fearful avoidant attacher is going through their own private hell where on one hand, they constantly feel tremendous loss and guilt over what they've done and want to do anything they can to try and fix the situation or relationship but simultaneously feeling powerless because they have no clue on how to undo that trauma and damage done to their brain, which is literally what's causing them to veer right instead of veer forward in these relationships. I gotta say, I know many people here have understandable grievances when they're dating fearful avoidance who aren't doing the work. And there are a lot of people out there who aren't, I get that. But I also wanna say, just think of it like this for a hot second. For those of you that, I know not everyone's gonna love hearing this and it's okay, you don't have to. But for those of you that are ready for it, could you just imagine where on one hand, you know you want love and you know you wanna be with someone, but as soon as you get close, you have an allergic reaction that compels you to back away from your partner and you just feel like you need to take some space to decompress. And that space can be all manner of things, drugs, workaholism, alcoholism, sex addiction, all manner of things where you're constantly in a position where you're like, I can't even control my brain. My brain's telling me that you're gross and I need to leave, but I know that as soon as I step away, I love you. It is so damn paralyzing where you feel like, I don't freaking know what's going on. And the thing is, is that anytime they get more vulnerable and close with you, they don't have a clue as to why they're feeling the way they're feeling. They just shut down and they're like, I need to get out of here. I need to push my partner away. It is self-sabotage on steroids. Now, I wanna make it very clear. 
I am not excusing the pain and the impact that this causes their partner that's going through this. I recognize how damn dysfunctional and dangerous it is as a consequence of this. But I also want to say too, that whilst they're going through their own stuff, you, the recipient, are also going through your own stuff and it's both hurting people tremendously. But I also want to say one clear thing about this. You are the person who is going through the withdrawal aspects of this, not them. In all the literature that I've read across all of my clients, the fearful avoidant attacher in this dynamic will not feel the same sense of immense insecurity, withdrawal, and also drug-like highs that you go through as a consequence of this dynamic. You are the one who often has to face that insecurity, all that crap head on to work through this recovery. And it's the shittest thing of all is that you often may be the one when you're dating someone like this to break free of this. It is really fucking painful. As often my clients say, it is the most head fuck experience they've ever had in their life. Because unlike being with someone who's just a classic narcissist, often these people are sensitive, sweet human beings who are just reacting out of trauma. And it's, you know, really difficult when on one hand, you can tell they're genuine when they're apologizing for this. And yet at the same time, they can be seemingly so malicious when they're pushing away and trying to get away from you. These boomerang style situationships and relationships have cost people years of their life. I have seen so many individuals where they have found themselves in the pits of despair as they're pushed away once again by their partner where they've tried to figure out a way to make things work. It is really, really brutal. And I, my heart goes out to people who are in the thick of this because this is where I'm gonna talk about now steps for recovery. I'm gonna be brutally, brutally honest about this because people who are in the thick of this who are either the fearful avoidant or the person dating them, unless you feel like you have a support network and a system in place to help you gradually get out of this, there is something that you have to accept, which is you are now in a position of love addiction and this is a very real thing and you may need more than therapy to get out of this situation. All the psychoeducation on this sort of stuff may ultimately fall flat in the face. You may need to find a support group, a 12-step recovery program, whether it's Codependence Anonymous or SLA, which is for Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous, to get help out of this. You may need a team of professionals to speak to, and I know a lot of people do not have the financial resources to have that. In which case, getting psychoeducation on this sort of stuff is really important, and maybe finding a free network of people who can actually support you on their own dime, if that's an availability, is the next best thing. You do not need therapists who do not get this stuff. It is fucking hard to get out of this. As someone who's never been through this, I can see how damn hard it is. I've navigated people who've gone through narcissistic relationships and that's its own kettle of fish. That's a trauma bond of its own kind. But a trauma bond with someone who has a severe fearful avoidant attachment style, especially someone who isn't necessarily narcissistic, is bloody hard for its own reasons. And I've seen people just find that it's just too much to go through to the point where it's really, really difficult. And for those of the people who are fearful avoidant in this dynamic and are feeling powerless for very similar reasons, they too likely need a team to help support them through this. One counselor is or therapist is simply not enough in a lot of these cases, and they do often need a lot of intense work on themselves too, because it is really, really difficult for them to overcome a lot of their self-protective mechanisms that have kept them this way. Having accountability groups is a good start because at the very least it gives people a space where they feel safe, where they can have a lot of their stuff reflected and being like, hey, I can see you doing the thing again. Can you actually just focus on this? And it calls people out to actually focus on stuff. Please bear in mind that when we look at this sort of, like when people are in the thick of this, I have to say, even though I'm someone who considers myself really good at the grief recovery stage and the work on codependency, if you are in the thick of it with someone with a fearful avoidant attachment style or you are the fearful avoidant and still engaging with people like this, you can't really do inner work at this point in time. It's like if you're addicted to drugs and alcohol, you have to deal with the addiction first to then get to the root of why you're here in the first place. 
And if you're constantly in this situation where you as the fearful avoidant are seeking this person out out of a place of loneliness and the person who's engaging with this as the love addict is seeking you out to make them feel better about themselves, neither one of you are going to necessarily be able to pull free and come back at this from a place of objectivity. It's just too damn hard and it's really difficult to even process or go to therapy traditionally to work on this because it's really hard. I have to say, I think some of the worst instances I've heard of this include people I've known who are fearful avoidance, who have recognized that they love their partner and have literally flown overseas to be with them before they get the ick when they're too close and pull away and they know it affects their partner so much and they feel tremendously guilty and they've tried everything in their power to, you know, to fix this and they just can't. I've seen people who are on the receiving end of this who spend millions of dollars, time and energy trying to, you know, make a relationship work with one of these individuals and they've just found that it's just gone nowhere and it's been fruitless. Until both people, are, or at least one of them, is able to step away from this and to start working through this, these situationships and relationships can last decades and it's just really, really difficult Unfortunately, one of those individuals needs to ultimately fall out of love for this cycle to come to a brutal end. And that's when recovery can likely take its next step, which is working through a lot of that withdrawal, working through the insecurities that come up and getting to a place of emotional objectivity. I want to round this piece out by saying these boomerang situationships and relationships are not a joke. Fearful avoidant attaches who have a lot of insecurities, yes, have their own stuff, and I'm really sorry that they're going through their stuff, but the people caught in it, including people who have a dismissive avoidant attachment style, even a fearful avoidant attachment style, secures, anxious attaches, the people who are facing, who are, who are going through this, who are receiving this, is just brutal on so many levels, and it is really, really difficult. So, now that that piece is over, I'm very happy to invite people to ask me questions if they haven't already, and I'm very happy to just go through and work through some of the things that people want to talk about this or anything else that relates to anything that I talk about or anything that I'm happy to share and discuss. But I just want to, again, say I am sorry for everyone involved who is going through this because I can see the humanity in it. I can see how, quite frankly, how fucked it is for everyone involved. And you do both need a lot of hand-holding to get out of this particular case because of just how dysfunctional, painful, brutal, and just exhausting and disappointing it is. So, yeah, it's just really, really, really hard for everyone involved. So I am sorry that anyone who is going through this... And I will say, I have found that when I am working with clients who are on either side of this, it is a slow recovery process to getting out and I've seen people fall back in even when they thought that they were out. It just happens. So please bear in mind that it's okay if it's one step forward, two steps back at times because that's just the way of it in a lot of these particular situations in that it's often very much a non-linear recovery experience and it's really, really hard. Now, let's get into it. So let's... Let's go through this together. So uh, I'm starting with the questions in the question mark box and we'll go through things together. So my avoidant ex broke up with me and was already hooking up with people within a month. Still on a spree and frequent weed. Oh, yuck. Okay, so generally speaking, when avoidant attachers break up with you, they will resort to a lot of deactivation strategies, which can include drug addiction, sleeping around with new people and doing all kinds of things to avoid the pain of the guilt and the shame of the breakup. So please bear in mind that that's quite common. And I also feel like something that comes up a lot for people who are on the receiving end of this is they question, why is my partner not fighting for me? Or why are they making it seem like we never mattered and they're just moving on? You know, we have to understand that avoidant attachers who are, you know, doing this do not think the same way as their partner does. For those of us that have more of an anxious attachment style, hell, even a secure attachment style, even people who are mildly fearful avoidant would normally think, well, why wouldn't we fight for this relationship together? When someone is activated into their avoidant attachment, the last thing they're thinking about is fighting for the relationship. They're thinking to leave by any means possible. So please understand 
that when it comes to understanding their ethos, when they're stressed, you are not the priority. Their self-preservation comes first and they will do anything to do that. And they'll find ways to seek out intensity outside of you, what you, ex what you experience with them together, because they're looking for escapism. It's not okay how it makes you feel. It is brutal. It is not by any means all right for you to go through this. I'm just letting you know how it is. Next question. I'm an avoidant. Yay, welcome. Um, my ex-girlfriend is an anxious. Would, uh, what would your advice be after our breakup to not return to the boomerang effect where we start messaging each other because we miss each other just to break up again after three months? Great question. And I have to explain... Ugh, English. I have to also be honest with my own limitations and that I may not be able to provide the best advice here because this is sort of where some people ask me for very specific advice for their situation and I can't really provide it because counselling can't do that. Here is something where I'm actually going to express my limits. I actually don't know. Um, I have looked into a lot of research to try and figure out how to break a cycle like this. And from my, my best assessment is if you are the fearful avoidant and you have recognized that this is a dynamic that you're stuck in, one of you has to acknowledge the cycle with your partner and also explore ways to try and either work on it together as a couple or accept powerlessness over the situation and engage in therapy. There is no other way as far as I'm concerned from what I've seen and from what I'm gathered, trauma-informed therapy, 12-step recovery programs, having an integrated team is the way to go about it. And I think that also might mean you need to step away from each other for quite some significant time to allow your partner to work through the withdrawal effects of the breakup and also for yourself to also get some emotional objectivity around it too. I know for fearful avoidance, it can be tricky because <coughs> people can feel incredibly lonely. They miss being with other people and they also needed to feel better about themselves. The challenge for you is to be single and to allow yourself to sit with the discomfort that comes up as a consequence of that. But I want to go back to my limitations. I don't really know what the best solution is in these kind of cases for people who have a fearful avoidant attachment style and want to break free of this. My best recommendation would be definitely see if you can speak to a professional about this who is trauma informed and also has a background in working in these cases because it is bloody hard for both party members to recover and to also stop the cycle. Uh, oh, let's see. Um, it's hard and lonely at the moment. I'm just trying not to... Oh, th this person's replied. Thanks for the response to my question. It's really hard to be lonely at the moment. I know. I get it. I've got a mate who's fearful avoidant and has other things along the side of it. I know how much they struggled with this, so I get it. And I'm just trying not to message new people and just to hook up, breaking the cycle at the moment. I really get it. Because I know for a lot of people who have a fearful avoidant attachment style, it's the external validation seeking they need. They're constantly looking for reassurance that they're okay, that they're a good person. And I know that it can then start a new cycle straight away too. So believe me, I know that it's hard for you in your own way with this. Again, get a team to support you through this because your challenge is really just allowing yourself to feel enough by yourself, to feel that you are lovable and that you are also capable of taking care of yourself where others have failed to take care of you too. It is not easy. I don't know. That's the broad strokes. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see. Not really a question, but amen to all of this. Was with a fearful avoidant. The breakup obliterated my self-esteem. No real discussion or closure. I still love her. Wish I could help heal her trauma. I was confident and secure before being with her, but never felt so weak, fragile, anxious after a breakup. I want to take a moment here to validate everyone who probably feels the same way about that, even people who may feel incredibly angry off the back of this too, because, hey, that's a phase. I wanted to say many of us would probably do anything for our fearful avoidant attached, or even the dismissives, um, or even the anxious attaches, to actually recover, because often we can see their pain uh, more than sometimes they can see their own. And if we could have a relationship with them where they could overcome that, we would. Many of us would do anything to make it work to be with these individuals. And there's nothing wrong with desiring that. The painful thing to eventually get to is a place of reality, which is many of these individuals, unfortunately, will not. And it's up to them. And it's just brutal. It's not fair. It's horrible. I'm sorry to everyone who's going through this because 
I think honestly, every single avoidant attacher, anxious attacher, anyone who's got insecure attachment deserves a chance to recover and overcome their past. But we are not responsible for them to go through that journey. We have to learn that just because they are that way, it's up to them to take control of it. An infamous analogy that I've been using a lot lately and I've shared it across many of my lives is it'd be like if you have an STI. If you've got HIV, you've got herpes, it's not your fault that you receive that much of the time. However, it is your responsibility to make sure that you take care of it through medication if that's relevant to your STI. You are also informing other people and letting them know that this is something that you have and also making sure you reduce the impact that it has on you and other people. Same thing with trauma. If you are the way you are because of your upbringing, you didn't deserve what happened to you. No one should go through that kind of upbringing to become the way that you are. But unfortunately, the way you are might be also hurting a lot of people. Please take responsibility and accountability for it. Thank you. Uh, let's see. As a anxious secure, how can we deal with all the thoughts that come up after the breakup? One at a time, which I know is bloody hard to do. Um, okay, here's the thing to understand for anyone who is in the dynamic that I've described tonight, or anyone who's going through an abrupt breakup with someone who has an avoidant attachment style. You need to f you need to sit with all of that discomfort and pain off the back of the breakup and start challenging a lot of the thoughts that come up. Many thoughts come up like, I'm not lovable. I am not good enough. I don't really feel like I'm someone who's worthy of love. Maybe they're looking for someone who's better than me. Please understand that when it comes to this kind of experience, the withdrawal effects often come with obliterated self-esteem and feeling like you aren't good enough, that you are someone who caused the breakup. And it's really important to shift the pendulum from taking too much responsibility to accepting that you probably didn't do as much as you thought you did to cause this. To get to a stage where you challenge your inner critic that's bringing you down saying, you're too much. If only you'd done X, Y, and Z, then they would have done things differently and you wouldn't have had this outcome. Much of the time, this outcome was inevitable. There was nothing you could have done to fix this. And the other thing to also do too is when you are having moments where you are lonely and you miss your avoidant partner, allow yourself to miss them. It is okay to grieve. It doesn't mean you're crazy. It doesn't mean, you know, there's something wrong with you. People grieve these relationships and situationships for years. Even if they never slept with this person, even if they only knew them as a friend, please give yourself permission to grieve. It will take a long time. The more you put pressure on yourself to get over this by X date, the more difficult you will find overcoming this. So please bear in mind that it is a very difficult thing to overcome over time if you're putting all these arbitrary rules about when you should heal, especially if you've got friends and family who are telling you, you should be over it by now. Screw them. If they're not going through this or haven't gone through this, they don't get to comment. So frankly, please just be very gentle with yourself. Um, let's see. When talking about avoidance, it's quite common to speak about what they feel in the moment. Do they have object inconsistency? And if they don't, what's happening here? Thanks in advance. Um, so I'm, I guess to answer the first part of the question, I'd say the challenge for avoidant attaches is in my experience for a lot of them is because they're quite disconnected. They, at times they don't register what's going on a lot of the time with their thoughts and their feelings. And so in other words, they can understand the euphoria that they might feel. They might understand when they're feeling angry, but when it comes to more complex stuff like disappointment, loss, grief, depression, anxiety, that's where they may stumble and falter, especially when it comes to engaging with you. And it might, and they might say things like, oh, you know, it's really difficult for me to be vulnerable and express my feelings. I'd argue that if anything, yes, they may speak about how they're feeling in the moment, but a lot of the time I feel like they don't understand their own relationship with their feelings, meaning like they tend to treat their feelings like gospel, meaning like if I'm feeling this way, it must be true, rather than thinking my emotion is information that I need to sit with and process. It's not necessarily right or wrong. It is what it is. So I think that in that sense, 
a key thing I would say is that what I've observed is for them to sort of, it's kind of that ethos of like going with the flow. They sort of treat it as it is in the moment, but then also at times they may be sitting on some discomfort for a while that they won't talk to you about. Like the classic example would be you have a breakup where they say, yeah, I've been feeling this way for like two months, two years, and I just didn't let you know. So that's where I'd say it becomes really difficult because they don't have the language to be able to articulate what's going on. Something I've talked about before is that a lot of avoidant attachers have what we call alexithymia, which is an inability to identify emotions or to articulate them in a way that makes, you know, rational sense. I've had some clients who experience alexithymia and often I'm like, I have no idea what you just said, but I'm going to do my best to try and piece together the emotional stuff and we can come back to it and we can try and work through this together. And it is just a case of building that emotional vocabulary. Alexithymia is very real, especially for people who experience neurodiversity as well too, who are neurodivergent. So it's not just something that happens to people who are emotionally disconnected from themselves. I will be honest. When it comes to the second part of the question is, do they have object inconsistency? When I heard that, my brain went, that almost reminds me of when people have talked about how anxious attackers have object impermanence where like they struggle when the object of their affection is out of mind, out of sight, because they need to know that it's around them at all times. I feel like avoidant attachers almost have the complete opposite where it's almost like they want it out of mind, out of sight. So I hope that answers your question. And maybe I needed to, maybe I, I, if I was speaking with you one-on-one, -on -one, I could have sort of unpacked a bit of that too. But anyways, just wanted to um, go through that with you there. Great question here is during the breakup, when we feel immense withdrawals, what does the FA feel? Not the same thing. Um, often the people who are going through a breakup with someone who has severe fearful avoidant attachment style, we're feeling all like the immense impact of the rejection, the fear of abandonment and all that stuff, which is intense and hits us like a freight train. Here's what happens to the fearful avoidant. In the moment, they're often feeling disgust and annoyance with the partner and they just want to get away from them and they then feel a bit of relief. Often at times too, they can be feeling loss, guilt, shame, and they want to do anything to get away from some of those complex emotions. So they may look for distractions in the form of other partners, drugs, alcohol, work to get away from all of that. And once that cloud lifts, they often feel tremendously lonely again and want to reach back out to you and connect with you again. That's what I've observed. So that's generally how I've seen it play out. But often I find the dominant feelings there are not so much one of abandonment. If anything, it's more loss and longing and also not wanting to be alone. And often at times that's what propels them to come back whilst also feeling guilty for how they behaved. And like I've said on a few lives, they often want to feel absolved for their behavior. And so they'll often apologize in such a way where they want to basically get you to acknowledge what they've done without them having to acknowledge how they've made you feel. And to be fair to them, a lot of fearful avoidant attachers don't know how their behavior impacts you and to the extent that it really ruins our mental, emotional, and at times physical health and well-being. So I got to give them a bit of grace there to say they often don't understand the magnitude of what's happened and they probably don't have the capacity to really sit with that. Because again, many avoidant attachers have a bad relationship with guilt and they don't want to feel like they can't meet your needs. They're going to have a doomed relationship with you. Much of the reason as to why they think that they should leave is because they think that you can do so much better than them, that being with them is just a foregone conclusion that this is all going to go to shit. So part of this process for them when they're outside of the situation or relationship is more reconciling a lot of that emotional overwhelm and intense, you know, sensory overload. And once that dies down and they just feel loss and grief, that's when they're like, I want to come back to you. Dismissives, I find, often stubbornly convince themselves that you're going to do so much better than them anyways. So they often just trudge along forward without wanting to engage with a lot of those feelings. So typically I find they're not the ones who come back around. They're the ones who are just like, adios, I'm off. And they don't want to sit with the shit. That's the distinction I found in a lot of those cases. Uh, let's see. Do avoidance have fear of abandonment? Yes, they do, but it's subconscious for most of them. So dismissive avoidance have the classic conscious fear of intimacy and commitment and the subconscious fear of abandonment. So what does that mean? Well, basically what it means is, is that on one hand, they don't like getting emotionally close to people where they have to be vulnerable 
And that can be influenced by their fear of abandonment because part of their fear is if we get close, you may find out things about me that you don't like and you will reject me. So that's where it can subtly play into that. So they'll reject you first. But the second part of this can also be, let's say you've been in a long-term relationship with someone who has a dismissive avoidant attachment style. And I haven't talked about this much, but I've seen it play out. You have gotten to your wits end with someone who has a dismissive avoidant attachment style and you're burnt out and you're like, screw this, I'm out. You may present this to the person and be like, I'm done. And then what happens is at the end of this, that avoidant may end up having such feelings of abandonment and do anything in their power to prevent you from leaving. They'll go to therapy. They'll become incredibly needy and anxious. And you might be like, where did this come from? And it's because the thought of you leaving causes them to spiral and they don't like that feeling. This doesn't happen all the time across all dismissive avoidance, but I've also find, found, yeah, English, found for fearful avoidance, if you're the one who chooses to break up with them, they can become incredibly angry and defensive and feel like, you know, it's the end of the world. And they may make it seem like you're the bad person for leaving them and they don't have to feel so guilty for how their actions also contributed to this too. So the thing that I find for a lot of fearful avoidance is that they have more of a conscious fear of abandonment. And for them, it's a vicious cycle because they've already gone through a lot of rejection, inconsistency, not also having a lot of safety and stability in their upbringing. So for them, it's that real horrible self-fulfilling prophecy where on one hand, they want to be close with people, but at the same time, they tend to push those that care about them the most away out of fear of being hurt. And when this happens to such a degree that they keep doing this to those individuals, these people burn out and end up leaving, confirming that they're unlovable and that they're not good enough to be with people. And it's a pretty vicious cycle. Not every fearful avoidant will necessarily go through this, but it can be a trope that we see across a lot of fearful avoidance. So can be a thing. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here? How do avoidance treat their children? Do they share their intimacy and empathy to them? No. I'm just gonna put it out there, no. <laughs> um, they may be good at the superficial stuff. Like they may be very good at the highs, wanting to have a good time with you. But I have often found with working with my clients, uh, I've heard many stories of people who have severe avoidant attachment styles as mothers and fathers. And I would say there are common themes, early divorces, not wanting to engage with the kids, being the absent mother or father, being incredibly passive and enabling a lot of bad behavior from a very overly anxious or overbearing spouse. And also being in a position where there's a lot of cheating going on and there can also be a lot of emotional unavailability. So it's kind of like you're witnessing what it's like to date someone with severe avoidant attachment. Now, I want to say that's the severe side of the fence. Those that are not as severe can be fine. They can be perfectly reasonable and become very secure, loving folks. One thing I will give credit to the avoidant attachers is that unlike those people who are more anxiously attached, avoidant attachers tend to be very good in moments of high stress. They can be very functional and they can do such a good job of navigating difficult moments from time to time, depending on how they feel. Sometimes they can spiral over seemingly simple things, but other times, like if, for example, there's emergencies, like someone needs to go to hospital, some can be exceptional at just doing what they need to do to get things under control, whereas others can retreat because it brings up too much feelings of loss, it feels overwhelming, and they'll back away and maybe even have what we call weaponized incompetence. So I just want to make it clear that if you're dating someone with a fearful avoidant attachment style, you can kind of have a glimpse as to what it's like for them to be a mother or a father of a child, which is more of the same. We have to think about it too, right? Like, you know, if avoidant attaches, you know, had a bad experience in childhood and you are a child, you are quite literally a trigger for them because it can bring up very uncomfortable emotions. You may often find that as the child of an avoidant parent, you often simultaneously oscillate between, you know, them wanting to be with you as the parent, but at the same time being so superficial to the point where you feel like your parent doesn't have any way of relating to you. Meaning, you know, they want to have the 
title of your father or mother, or maybe they don't even want to at all. It can be very, it can be very like all over the shop. But at the same time, like anytime you try and get close and really vulnerable, they just can't do it. They may model what it's like to, you know, for you to just, for example, if you've gone through a breakup, they may be like, oh, just get over it. You'll find someone new tomorrow. They may model and also enable that kind of behavior and encourage you to do more of the same kind of stuff that they do to avoid their own emotions and well-being. It can make it seem like they're the one who's teaching you to just be cavalier, not deal with your emotions and just go with the flow. So as parents, if they aren't working on their stuff, it can be pretty nightmarish, but I got to tell you, anxious attachers who aren't working on their stuff too as parents, equally nightmarish for different reasons. But if they are working on their stuff, oh my God, they definitely work on the sins of their mothers and fathers very well. And they can be very competent to wanting to show intimacy and love to their kids. So I just want to say, it's not all avoidant attachers who can be terrible parents. A lot of them can turn out to be phenomenal parents. Just want to put it out there and say that. Uh, let's see. Can you tell us if it's normal to have memory issues when you ask an avoidant to clarify something they said before? He often forgets what he said previously. Yes. Uh, I, and I want to be clear that this is something that I have found can come from a place of when they're shutting down. Like, say, for example, you know, you're trying to remind an, someone, your partner who has avoidant attachment about something that you wanted to discuss. And it's something that relates to a very vulnerable topic for your partner. They may, if they're shutting down, forget about what's happened. They may act tired. They may actually gaslight you and say, you know, that's not what you said, or I remember things differently because they want to avoid dealing with a subject that causes them to feel discomfort. So unfortunately, yes, I've actually noticed this in a few people and it can be frustrating to say the least because you're like, don't you remember this thing we were talking about? And they almost want to act like you never had the conversation in the first place. So yes, it's very much out of sight, out of mind in some of those cases. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here? I am a fearful avoidant and relationship with a dismissive avoidant. What do you think of this dynamic? The dismissive avoidant definitely shows less emotion towards me and I can't even tell if he even liked me or not. Oh boy. Okay, so the fearful avoidant and dismissive avoidant dynamic can be problematic on so many levels for both people because it's like the anxious avoidant dynamic on steroids. For the fearful avoidant attacher who's seeking reassurance and sometimes, you know, uh, an escape from loneliness and also wanting to be emotionally validated, this can be one of two extremes. There can be a temporary period where it feels hunky-dory and great because they're not dealing with someone who's extremely overbearing and anxiously attached. But that period tends to last not for a while and it gets to a point where the emotional absence starts to bother both party members, particularly the fearful avoidant. And it gets to a situation where eventually it goes into the other scenario where it's like, they start to realize they're not getting their needs met and they don't feel like their partner actually cares for them. So the fearful avoidant attacher may become incredibly anxious and resort to some of their anxious behavior, saying things like, this is toxic, you don't love me, and try and get validation and self-esteem boosts from their partner. This can cause the dismissive avoidant to shut down even further and to act in a very cold and aloof manner to the point where they become incredibly dismissive and cold and also act like you have the problem. And so what happens here is that essentially you get to a nasty stalemate where the fearful avoidant attacher is not getting their needs met and the dismissive avoidant is feeling overwhelmed. So it feels like a classic anxious and avoidant dynamic, but the fearful avoidant attacher may end up cheating or leaving the relationship very quickly because they're not getting their needs met. Whereas the dismissive avoidant may then feel incredibly hurt and betrayed because they didn't see it coming. And it may also result in a whole bunch of other things. Point is, it can be nasty for both party members in this particular way. And it's really, 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 really brutal to be in the thick of that because it's essentially just a nightmare for both party members involved. I would, I really would say I pray for both party members because it's not an easy dynamic to be a part of by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, 
even too fearful avoidant attaches are their own fun match because then it becomes the case of now who's the more avoidant of the two of them because once the other person's avoidant attachment hits that's what causes the other person's anxious attachment side to skyrocket and it goes from there so in this sort of case it's literally like who's the more avoidant between the two of them and then how does it play out from there that's generally what i've noticed or like i said it can be more of the first thing which is like you're just both comfortable with one another, but you don't really get to a place of vulnerability and depth because you're afraid of that. And so it then becomes a case of who does a self-sabotage move first to get their emotional needs met, and that's what causes the relationship to break up. Those ones can last a while, but if it's scenario two, it can last a very short time. So yeah, that's what I've noticed. Eh, what have we also got here? Uh, can it be a boomerang if you came back over a year later? Yeah, I think it's a boomerang. Generally speaking, when I refer to like a boomerang situation or relationship, what I'm talking about is, and I want to be very specific about this, it's basically when you've had someone with severe avoidant attachment circle back around, repeat the same issues, and they're not getting resolved. That's what I would call a boomerang situation. They left you without closure, they came back, and the cycle repeated itself that's a boomerang sort of situation. If it got better, don't call it that necessarily, because obviously things amended and got better over time, which is what we want. But if it didn't do that, we're not talking about the same thing then. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Gosh, I've got so many good questions here today. Thank you very much, everyone, by the way. Uh, we He didn't commit to me, but committed to her quickly. Do you think that he likes her more? We dated, he ended it, came back ages later, left again, now committed to someone else. I mean, not necessarily. Okay, I want to make a, a quick note here for everyone. I know everyone does this thing, and I used to do it too, which is this whole thing of like, well, if my avoidant partner is getting with this new person, it clearly means they like them more than me. And I can understand why people would say this, because if you see on social media that they're getting, you know, they're developing into a relationship if you never even had that. They're officializing things. Hell, they're getting married. They're having kids. They're doing all the things that you never did. I get that you might automatically think they like that person more than you. And I want to say here, no. Hitting those milestones, ticking those boxes, does not necessarily reflect how much someone likes someone. Those things, you know, getting into a relationship, having kids, and also being married, can be very euphoric decisions that people make from a very irrational place. People often have the desire to have kids, not necessarily because they planned it out, but because they love the idea of it. And it's not to say that people don't think about this. Often they do. But I'm trying to say that when people are in relationships where, with you, there's been an issue because that person wasn't able to be vulnerable with you, what are the chances they're able to be vulnerable with the new partner? Sure, they can do all these things, but we have to remember too that depth, emotional intimacy, is something that's not easily accessible for everyone. And just because someone is able to do all these, you know, box ticking activities, doesn't mean the relationship is deep. It might mean that it's easy and superficial and they're not actually engaging with deep issues that actually need to be addressed. So that's something I just want to bear in mind. As someone who's witnessed this so many times, two people getting together and having kids and also seemingly having a picturesque relationship, I've heard so many avoidant attaches scream in agony, complaining about how they're not getting their emotional needs met. So please bear in mind that it is not necessarily a reflection of their happiness in that new relationship. Or whether they liked, you know, this new person more than you. But I get why people think it. Uh, if an avoidant says or thinks you can do better than them, I guess we should just believe them. Yeah. But I know that it may not be easy for you to believe that in the moment, and a lot of people don't. I mean, I get it. You've just dated someone who you think is the most amazing human being on the earth, and I get that. But I also just want to say that, you know, please bear in mind that you're probably not going to automatically believe that you can do so much better than them. You've often thought that you found your soulmate for very good reasons. So, you know, over time, you will come to believe it. But in the thick of it, don't beat yourself up if you don't believe it straight away. You will eventually, but not just now. I've got a really good question here, which is, I've noticed dismissive avoidance don't compliment or validate you much, if at all. Is that a common dismissive avoidant trait? Yes. Many dismissive avoidance, I find, are not good at words of affirmation, and some of them may be even reluctant to say they love you. I often find it's, for them, it can be a feeling of, like, weakness, like, you know, 
I'm giving too much of my power away to this person. I'm ceding my independence to actually have this kind of level of like, you know, um, relationship with someone that I'm with. So yes, it is unfortunately a common dispositional trait of dismissive avoidance to not compliment or even affirm their love for a partner. And it can be really, really painful for the people on the receiving end of that. So I am sorry if you've gone through that. And I should also say some fearful avoidance will do that too, but I find dismissives do it more often than not. Do fearful avoidance ever really change? Mine won't leave me alone, but won't commit either. It's so frustrating. Okay, two parts to that. Yours sounds like they're not willing to change at the moment. And yes, it is frustrating. I gotta tell you, as someone who listens to this stuff, it, it's not only frustrating, but it's exhausting. Not meaning that I'm exhausted listening to it, meaning more like I feel my client's exhaustion who are going through it because it's full on. Uh, do fearful avoidance ever change? No, <laughs> I'm joking. They do. Fearful avoidant attaches will change if they want to change. And in my experience, a catalyst for change is fear of abandonment. Many people who have suffered abandonment, like most of my audience have, often find this is the catalyst for them wanting to work on themselves. But please bear in mind that for a fearful avoidant to want to work on change on themselves, they have to get to a point where they're like, I'm done. I can't live like this anymore. I want a genuine relationship. I don't want to be in this position anymore. To the people who are identifying with fearful avoidant attachment in this particular chat, congratulations to you. You're doing an amazing job. Keep at it because it is not easy. I work with avoidant clients. I know the slow burn it takes. Please bear in mind, you absolutely can change. It just takes a lot of time and effort, but you can get there. I got colleagues who tell me about it all the time. There's books written about this all the time. They can, they have to have the willingness to do so. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? What can you say to soothe the situation and make an ex-avoidant partner see you are not as a threat? You can't. I'm just gonna point it out. You cannot do that. Because in my experience, and I could be wrong, it may have helped. If someone's got a different story that they want to throw out there and say, I did it, please bring it up because I want this to be academic for everyone. In my experience, it's often very hard to tell them, hey, I'm not the issue here. Because the thing is, is that they know they are the issue, but they want to project and make it seem like it's you a lot of the time. And a lot of them do not want to acknowledge the elephant in the room, which is their own stuff. It is like pointing out to someone that they're gay before they're ready. They will not necessarily love to hear that. So please bear in mind, it is a journey for them to come to this realization. And often a lot of them privately know that they have stuff that they have to work through, but they're often in denial over it. I get it. A lot of us are over denial over a lot of our own identity stuff too. You can try and reach out to them. Please, you can definitely reach out to them and let them know that you have identified that this might be a challenge by saying something like, I just want to let you know, I have noticed that there is this stuff going on between us every time we get close. What are your thoughts on this? But don't expect them to necessarily be like, oh, you're right, I'm the problem, it's me. Because often than not, they haven't listened to that track by Taylor Swift yet. It will maybe come to them eventually in, like down the line. So please bear in mind, it's not necessarily something that they're necessarily going to just, you know, figure out over time. I've got someone here saying, thank you for saying that. I'm a fearful avoidant. I'm willing to change, but it's so damn hard. It feels like I'm ripping myself apart. I know. I wanted to say here that if you've grown up being a fearful avoidant, you are not suddenly going to unlearn being a fearful avoidant overnight. As someone who is in the thick of their anxious attachment and didn't realize it until I'd gone through a breakup with someone who I definitely think has avoidant attachment, I can tell you, I wasn't willing to change until my way of being was not serving me anymore. That is usually how it goes. So that's why I just want to say, please bear in mind that if you are a fearful avoidant and you're like, I don't see the purpose in change, but I know I have to, I get it. It's not necessarily something that I would say is easy to do or recognize that you have to do. I've only changed because I had to, because I was in so much pain that I was like, enough, I need to fix my shit up. Often, unfortunately, that's the catalyst. So, you know, it is what it is. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Do avoidance often go quiet and inward when dealing with stress or difficult family situations? Yes, 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 yes. Love this question and yes. Um, often I find that avoidant attaches, if they're going through a tough time mentally and they don't feel particularly good about themselves, meaning like they're going through a bad time at work, family situations, death in the family, 
they don't usually involve you. They often retreat into their own isolation shell because they're processing with it. And they often feel like it's tremendously difficult to, you know, navigate the situation in, you know, with and involve their partner. They don't want to feel weak. They don't want to feel vulnerable. They don't want to feel like, you know, you're going to reject them for going through a difficult period of time. So often in these moments, they not only go through a period of inward reflection, they may even reject you abruptly as well too. So please bear in mind, it can happen. Will you please share your story someday um, with all of us? I'm assuming this is my story. I don't, I'm going to be honest. Um, I'll have to think about that quite hard. I don't really feel comfortable sharing my story on a public platform for my own protection of privacy, but I've shared bits and pieces about it here and there. So I'll think about it. Um, but it's very similar to what a lot of people have gone through. I'm just going to say that. Do you have any suggestions or books on how to work on not being a fearful avoidant? I really want to work on this. Um, yeah, uh, there's a few that I could think of that I've recommended recently to people that I, I recommend. And yeah, I'll, I'll write them down in the... Actually, I can probably do it now. Um, so if you're looking for books and resources on fearful avoidant attachment style, um, book recommendations, hopefully the character limit will allow me to do this. So that way everyone's got access to this. Uh, some of these you're going to know, so bear with me. Um, I'm going to recommend uh, Facing Love Addiction because that's got some advice for people who are love avoidance or avoidantly attached by Pia Melody or Pia Melody. That's a favourite of mine. Um, the other one I always recommend is Crazy For You, which is a more modern, up-to-date version of that. Um, Crazy For You by... Uh, I always know her name, Kerry Cohen. She's written, that book was amazing. Uh, the other one I also recommend too is Disorganized Attached No More by Taha Zeed, I think is his name. And the other one that I'm going to recommend people that I've started to recommend to people is also Trauma and the Avoidant Client. And you may be wondering, why am I recommending clinical books? Because if you understand it, you can understand how your defense mechanisms come up in counseling and therapy and maybe give you some insight on how to work on yourself too. So you may actually find it really valuable. I love that book. It was really, really good. So I recommend that. That's my recommendations and I'll write them out later as well too for everyone too. And let's see what else we got. I also wanted to say too, can I just make a point? Um, and by the way, I saw someone <laughs> wrote, I should write a, um, a book secretly and promote it. Maybe. Um, what I wanted to say is, in my experience, I have not noticed many books that are good on fearful avoidant attaches. Hell, I haven't even really noticed many books that are great for avoidant attaches in general. Um, I'm really trying my hardest to find more research and material on this um, because I find that there isn't a lot of really good stuff that's helpful for people with avoidant attachment. I think people think, oh, you know, it's just a case of allowing you to be more comfortable with, you know, having partners in your space and overcoming your fears of being engulfed. It's not that fucking simple. If it was that simple, everyone would be jumping at the bits to do it. But the reality is it's way more complicated than that. And that's why I think, and everyone's different too. Like for some people, it might be easy. Like for me, I found recovery from anxious attachment was a breeze compared to other things I've faced in my life. But I mean, it was hard, but it was not as hard, honestly, as going through an avoidant breakup. That shit broke me. Um, I think that when it comes to, you know, dealing with this sort of stuff, I hope, and maybe I'll contribute to this, I hope that there is literature available that really helps work through this because it's not easy, but I know there are, uh, there are therapists and counselors and psychologists who are skilled on this stuff who could definitely be of assistance in helping because they themselves may have avoidant attachment that they've overcome. But I just want to say, you know, um, in addition to what this other person was saying, uh, coach Craig Kenneth, great name, by the way, on YouTube has a video summarizing trauma and the avoidant client. And it's really good. Yeah. I, if, you go to this particular person and other people who have avoidant attachment who are working on their stuff, you may find answers and resources that aren't publicly available in traditional academic forums and circles. That's my recommendation. Hell, even Reddit and Quora occasionally has some good stuff on there too. So I just say spread out and look for stuff that's available there. I've read a few academic journals on this, but I find them so 
dry and scientific that they don't often provide a really good assessment as to what actually works at a practical level. So not my recommendation there, but yeah, that's just my general thoughts and feelings on it. Um, let's see, what else have we got here? Gosh, again, so many great questions on this stuff too. Um, do you think these recovery steps are also useful to get out of a narcissistic relationship? Hell yeah. If I've worked with a lot of people who've gone through narcissistic relationships, but there's one thing that I find dominant that is different off like immediately when I've dealt with someone who's gone through an, like a narcissistic relationship is their sense of reality is completely obliterated. And often they're having like an internal tape of their abuser, you know, gaslighting them. And so often I find like, that's the first thing that needs to be worked on. And then there's all the usual other stuff like the withdrawal recovery as well too. But I have to be honest, breakup recovery from a narcissist in my experience with working with clients. And look, I'm not someone who's ever been with a narcissist. So I don't know what that experience is like in the moment. But generally speaking, I found that it's similar, but different. And that's, so I would say that the steps are there, but you need to have a step accounting for gaslighting recovery because as this person has also said too, often a lot of times people feel like a sense of relief after breaking up with a narc. I know some people feel tremendous loss as well too. So it can be very binary, but a lot of people feel relief. Breaking up with an avoidant, even if you're the one to break up with them, doesn't feel like relief for much of the time. In fact, it feels dreadful. Got a great question here, which is, how do you adjust to feeling calm and boring? How do you adjust to a calm and boring relationship with a secure person after avoidant attaches? Oh boy. Um, short answer is it takes a long time uh, and a lot of therapy and also a lot of inner child work. And I mean, you can start on that without the therapist, but I think that what I would say is it takes so much damn time. Um, you essentially need to go through a lot of phases where you start out with this. Start practicing secure behavior. Start learning what it's like to be secure, having boundaries, learning how to assert yourself, have active communication, because that's step one. That's a really good step. Step two, by the way, some of these are not in order. Get educated on what it's like to be someone with secure attachment and start working on your own red flags in your insecure attachment, because that'll help out as well too. Step three, um, definitely learn to emotionally regulate and also to work through a lot of big emotions, because often I find... People who are attracting people who have insecure attachment are equally emotionally dysregulated. So really do that deep dive in finding tools and techniques like tapping, journaling, breath work, meditation, yoga, to work on your emotional stuff and to dig deep into why you are who you are. I would also highly recommend doing what I call a friendship audit. And that means you may have to start finding your secure friends and really figuring out who you can be vulnerable with and having secure relationships with your friends. Have a dating detox. Take time away from dating and really take time to better understand yourself and be single and get used to it. And this is where I think therapy is really helpful. Do some inner child work. Often we're still picking avoidant partners or anxious partners because it's what we're used to doing based on like conditioning and a whole bunch of things. Getting to the root of that is really important. It's going to take a while. Often they say it's a three to five year recovery process to get to a point where you're more, your body's more adjusted to a secure relationship because often our bodies are not. So please bear in mind, that's not always the case. Some people it's been shown can actually get to this stage without doing all that, you know, all of that intense stuff with a therapist, but a lot of the time it does help. So just putting it out there and saying, I'd highly recommend it. I've tried doing it on my own exclusively. I found it has helped having someone who's actually capable of spotting my blind spots and has also gone through the journey themselves. So just saying it as it is. Um, but I will say one thing that's clear, getting used to secure is an adjustment. It's new, it's weird, it's different. I will be honest and say my most electric relationships and situationships have always been with the avoidant attaches. Thank you very much. I'm glad I ticked that box off. Didn't want the trauma, but I enjoyed the experience. Um, and I have tremendous respect for them as people. Like, thank you. But at the same time, a lot of people who I've also know are in secure relationships will always look back and say the avoidant attaches were the best chemistry, but the people that they're with now, it's just different, but it's sustainable and it's emotionally fulfilling which is often something that's missing with the avoidant attaches over time. So yeah, that's something that we've noticed. Um, what else have we got here? 
What is a blanket form of advice for someone still struggling to get over an abrupt, fearful, avoidant breakup a year later? I just can't seem to let it go. My life has just spiraled since. Okay, that's very relatable for a lot of people. And I'm laughing because I was thinking about a client. Okay, I'm actually going to share a bit of a client story today because this has happened to so many people. Um, (laughs) You have to kind of become a bit of a spiritualist when you're going through these experiences sometimes because... There are some weird hokey things that can happen. So for anyone who doesn't want to hear this story, please bear in mind that I know that this isn't necessarily for everyone and I'm not going to share um, client privacy and confidentiality, but I'm going to share something that has happened generally for a lot of my clients, which is often when they're going through the breakup recovery process, they reach a point where they're so, they're still like not over their ex And they often have these moments where it's almost like a coming to God moment where they may even just like, you know, write a letter to their ex as like a forgiveness letter. They may even just be like, fuck it, I need to let this go. And they may get to a point where they're just like, you know, I wish them all the best and I'm no longer hoping for them. When all of a sudden it's like literally tomorrow, their avoidant ex reaches back out to them and apologizes for things or they interact with them. And it's just like, what the fuck? Like, you know, I've literally decided as of yesterday to like pour my heart out on a paper to give you up or to do this. And all of a sudden you're back in my life. Like what the hell is going on universe? So I am just going to put it out there and say, there are some weird things that happen spiritually speaking when that shit happens. And you'll know what I mean if you've ever gone through it, but putting that to one side for a minute, a blanket statement for those of you that are still not over your exes, even a year later, I don't really have one other than to say, I think if you're still holding on to this person, allow yourself to hold on to them. Like, I know it's painful. Maybe you'll feel like you'll never meet someone as amazing as them again. And you know what? That's okay. Maybe this is your duration of feeling grief and everyone's, you know, duration of feeling the pain is different. So I think the key thing I would say here is please understand that everyone feels things differently and takes time to work through this stuff at different rates. But I think generally speaking, Just be gentle with yourself. Don't force yourself to try and, you know, let go of this person yet. If they're still the best person that you ever knew, one of the things that I've done that's really helped me is actually allow myself to fantasize what a future with that person would have been like and to mourn the fact that it's not going to happen because it really allows me to honor the fantasy of what I wanted and also to grieve the reality that it's never going to be that way. I also think too that working with people could also really help you understand your situation because it gets to a point where you're like, I'm powerless to this and I need support and help to you know, have a mindset shift around it. But I think it's different depending on who you are and what you're going through. But I'd still want to say to people who are still feeling it, I get it. I've got a best friend who thought that she was never going to get over you know, her avoidant ex because she was still caught up and madly in love with him. And then she met a new partner who she's found is really secure. And, it's t- and it took her about three to four years to you know, get to a stage where you know, she went from breakup to where she is now, but she was still holding on to like a bit of that flame and a bit of that hope. So, you know, it does happen. But the good news is is that life does move on and things do get better over time. But it is one of those things where, you know, it can take time and even maybe meeting new people and dating new people to realize there are going to be people who are better than your avoidantly attached ex of the past and maybe they're better for you. So dating can sometimes be cathartic for that too. It just... You know, it's not often always up to our control and then sometimes it is, but you know, it's different depending on each person. That's my blanket statement. Um, Let's see, what else have we got here as well too? Oh, two new questions. Um, Do gaslighters know they are engaging in gaslighting behaviors? Not usually. I've often found people who are gaslighters typically don't know that they're gaslighting people in my experience because you have to think about it like this. People who are gaslighting, generally speaking, have a pretty flawed understanding of reality and they're projecting their flawed conception of reality onto you. So as a consequence, you are taking their faulty, irrational, emotionally dysregulated version of events to protect them from dealing with reality. And so as a consequence, it's done as a way, often sometimes offensively and defensively, to protect the gaslighter from dealing with the reality of the situation that they're in. That's generally what I've noticed. But once again, there is no excuse for such behavior because it drives people insane. Um, Are there any strategies you would recommend for addressing being on the receiving end of gaslighting? I feel like clean slating, ignoring, starting over doesn't help or fix things if it's a repeated cycle. 
To your second point, you are absolutely correct. If it's a repeated cycle and that person isn't doing anything about it, game over. There's nothing you can really do in that situation. But if you bring it to their attention and being like, hey, that felt a bit gaslighty or I feel like my reality is being invalidated and they are aware of it and they're like, holy shit, I'm so sorry, I didn't mean to do that to you. You might be working with someone who actually can take accountability that it's a defense mechanism and they're not actively doing that to protect themselves from an offensive place. So I hope that makes a bit of sense. Um, uh, let's see, what else have we got here? Why does my dismissive avoidant ex suddenly act mean and distant after saying he wants to work on the relationship? Because you both probably got to a point where you were very vulnerable and close and that was all it took for them to freak out, shut down, become defensive and want to push you away. So please, 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 please bear in mind that if you've had a very vulnerable moment and they've said, yeah, I want to work on this, but then all of a sudden they've 180 on you, there is a high likelihood that they've been triggered now and now they want to push you away again. Is it okay? No. Is it not? Is it brutal? Yes. Do you deserve this? No. Is it personal? No. Could there be maybe some other stuff going on there too? Possibly. Without knowing your situation, I wouldn't know. And that leads me on to actually reply to this person who said, I feel like avoidance are catnip for analytical people to have something to always analyze. That's part of what makes them addicting. Hello, I am very much in that category. You know, I am someone who has seemingly built a business on analyzing people with avoidant attachment because it's endlessly fascinating and really interesting. And maybe that's my stuff to talk to with my therapist about this too. It's like, why the fuck am I still talking about this years after the fact too? I get it. You know, I think there is actually, there's always something that's mysterious and sometimes very aloof about avoidant attaches. And if we put that to one side for a minute, it's very easy to psychoanalyze them because there are so many gaps that we often have to fill in for ourselves as well too. Plus, often at times I think we know our avoidant partners and friends and family members better than they know themselves. So, you know, I will say you will have a PhD in psychology if you've ever dated someone with avoidant attachment very soon because you often feel like you know them better than they know themselves and they are wearing their trauma on their sleeve sometimes. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a thing, I would say. Although, please don't take it to the point where it's like me and you make an entire social media account talking about it. Um, but I will say that if anyone wants to start a social media account talking about avoidant attachment, I'm going to say as a former marketer, it seems to be a very popular subject. So you may end up finding that you get a lot of engagement. So just want to put that out there, but do it for the right reasons. Don't do it to de demonize avoidant attachers because they're not all bad. They've, a lot of them have gone through enough shit in their life that they don't deserve it. Um, I think I'm nearly done with the question mark box, which is amazeballs. Uh, so I can move on to some of the stuff that we... Yeah, I can move on to the, some of the stuff in the chat. All right, um, we've got someone here saying, my dismissive avoidant told me yesterday that I'm too analytical and frequently calls me Dr. Phil. I have to kind of laugh at that because that's, you know, that's funny. And I get it. Um, could I develop a fearful avoidant attachment over the course of the relationship with my ex? Hell yeah. You've been in an abusive relationship with someone who particularly might be a narcissist. Yeah, that'll bring on you know, an attachment insecurity for sure. So yes, it does happen. Um, what if you worked on the relationship with an avoidant and things got better, but there are still a gaps of distance and lack of care? Would it be bad for your soul deprivation of affection? I mean, I guess it depends on how much, right? Like, I mean, if you're at a point where things are getting better, now here's the rub. Is it getting better enough for you? If you're feeling like it's getting better to the point where you're like, okay, I can kind of put up with a bit of, you know, the lack of affection here and there, but I can generally feel like we're getting better. More power to you. I got to tell you though, it's a rocky road. It usually gets worse before it gets better. And then it's sort of just like this disjointed, you know, linear journey, sorry, non-linear journey to improvement. And it would be the same if you were dating someone with severe anxious attachment who was working on themselves. So generally speaking, I would say it's rough going, but... Also, please bear in mind, are you at a stage where you're more emotionally mature than your partner? Do you want to put up with this? Many people choose not to because it's just too hard and like, no, screw this. This is just, maybe not screw this. They don't think of it like that. They're more just thinking, this is too emotionally demanding for me. I'm hurting too much just trying to walk this person through it. Uh, an example that I find a lot of people who are in the LGBTQI plus community often feel is uh, as a gay man, I don't date people who are closeted, meaning I don't date people who generally are still ashamed of their sexuality because we're at two different stages. 
I'm at a stage where I've embraced my sexuality, then I don't want to date someone who hasn't. The best equivalent I could give is if you're someone who is, say, has lingering internalized misogyny, misandry, and you're projecting that onto a bunch of people, it's just going to cause so many issues because there's lack of self-acceptance and that's just going to cause butting heads and a whole bunch of issues. You're playing different games of tennis. One of you is at a different stage than the other. It is what it is. And you're allowed to be, you know, at a point where you're like, I'm not getting my needs met. I love you and I want the best for you, but I just feel like I'm not getting what I need out of this. But others of you will be like, we're at similar stages and I can, you know, we can work on this together. And that's actually a very powerful, fast track way to work on stuff. And I praise anyone who goes through that because that can be tremendous in recovery and also healing from attachment wounds. Uh, I think I am going to round out very soon because I need a late dinner. Um, but I'm just going to quickly go up to the top and see anything else that I've got here too. Um, oh, I've got someone here who's identifying with avoidant attachment saying, the scary part is that I let my parents shape me to be an avoidant. I learned that while going to therapy for the last three months. It's awful to realize that after 26 years. Okay. Very valid and fair. To anyone who's got avoidant attachment and making them feel like, you know, they let their parents shape them. I want to say on one hand, I am sorry that you've gone through that and that you feel like this is what's led you to be this way. You also aren't responsible for your parents shaping you. That was their job to do that. It's not like you could fight them. I often have to remind my clients, it's like, hey, if there was a reason as to why you couldn't have boundaries as a kid, it's maybe because the environment didn't allow you for it. You're a child, you're vulnerable. You're not supposed to know how to protect yourself, you know, as a kid. Like that's what kids are. So just wanting to give you a bit of grace and say, I get that you may feel powerless and it makes you feel weak, but please bear in mind, that's what a child is. So you're not supposed to be Superman at that stage. And I know that's hard for many avoidant attachers. Many of you have phenomenal egos wanting to be Superman and Superwoman. I respect that. Please allow yourself to be a bit more vulnerable in allowing yourself to realize you don't have control over everything. And you also had moments where you've been made to feel vulnerable, where you also didn't have maybe a choice in the matter too. And I am sorry that you've gone through that. Uh, let's see, what else have we got here too? I feel so guilty for being the anxious one who left my fearful avoidant after four years. Do you see this often? And any advice on how I might benefit from shifting my thinking? Yes, I can see that a lot. And I can understand why, especially if you're reading into this and being like, oh my God, I've now done the very thing that my avoidant partner's parents did to them in abandoning them and not giving them love. And you may feel like you contributed to their trauma. I want to say that on one hand, you can feel, I can understand feeling guilty for that, but also at the same time, the thing to challenge is that sense of guilt, which is, hold on a minute, how did you get here? Because if your avoidant partner also contributed to this dynamic and it got to a point where you're like, I need to get away from this for my own health and well-being, you were led there also by their behavior. So my shorthand way of working through this, which is very reductive, and I think you'd need one-on-one -on -one time with someone to speak to about this, is to say, definitely take the time to realize, you know, you can only do so much in these kind of dynamics and situationships. So, you know, it's one of those things where if you got there at that stage, you know, it's not like you crossed any values of yours. You probably got to a stage where you were pushed and prodded and eventually provoked to do said action in the first place. So please bear in mind what's your responsibility and what led you to ultimately get to a place where you left. It's very normal to feel the guilt, but a lot of this does also sound like manufactured guilt, and that's not a guilt that you want to feel. Um, I'm going to round out very soon and finish this off. Um, let's see. By the way, I can see there's been a really good conversation going on between a lot of people who are frequent followers of mine. Thank you very much. I really appreciate, you know, sharing all of this because this has been amazing. And I have to say that it's been really good to have an audience who really does support and help everyone because it's been, I think it is one of those things where it is very, very challenging to go through an experience like this, regardless of what your attachment style is. So I love the fact that my audience, generally speaking, seems to be very supportive and empathetic towards one another. And I really appreciate that. All right, I'm going to do one more and then your boy is getting dinner. Um, I'm a fearful avoidant and I don't really get the loneliness part. I'd rather be on my own for months and I have been in total isolation, my choice. 
than be with the wrong people. To which I want to say congratulations to you. I find that some people who are more introverted leaning may actually end up being very much like that as well too. So they may not have that same sense of loneliness, but their fearful of, oh, excuse me, their fearful avoidant attachment style comes out in different ways as well too. For some others, it could be more of a case that they're mistrustful of others. And so it's that sense of like, I can't be with people that is more the compelling side of things than the fear of loneliness and not being with people too. So I would say there would be other shades to this that might be coming out too, but you know, huge spectrum of people go through different things. All right. I just want to say as I'm running out, thank you very much as always for joining this live on this topic. Um, it's been great talking about this with everyone and I look forward to just, you know, bouncing on here periodically before I get posting again to provide more psychoeducation to people. But it's always good to talk about these things because I often find I get these lessons from client sessions and I'm like, I'm going to talk about this. So I hope this has been of value to people um, who've been going through this. Uh, and thank you, by the way, for everyone who um, is sharing the gratitude. I really appreciate it. I love talking about this stuff. As someone was saying, this is my catnip. Maybe I'm an addict to learning about this stuff. Maybe I need to talk about this with my own therapist. So, you know, it is its own thing. Have a great day, everyone, and I will see you for the next live.